it's with a heavy heart that I express my condolences over the death of Polk County Deputy Joshua Owen, who gave his life in the line of duty. And uh, also express my sympathy for the other two officers who were shot. Um, there was a time in the history of our culture where such men would be honored above and beyond the criminals who they have to face on a day-to-day -day basis. That's not the world we live in anymore. Um, there will no, there will be no public squares named in the honor of Joshua Owen. There will be no national riots or protests. Um, there will be no outpouring of international support on behalf of Joshua Owen. Um, because he was just a police officer, a sheriff's deputy, a law enforcement officer. And as we know in the modern day, those folks, according to those who are in charge of the mainstream cultural discourse, are worthy of our contempt. Those folks have been called racists. They've been called white supremacists. Uh, the worst has been presumed of their motives at every opportunity, in spite of the fact that we're talking about people. When we talk about our law enforcement officers, whether they're sheriff's deputies or police officers, metro transit, whatever the case may be, we're talking about folks who volunteer to get paid less than they're worth in order to put themselves in harm's way to stand as the last line of defense between us and the worst of us, the worst of society. And by the way, simultaneously, the worst of society, who they defend us from, we laud as somehow victims, somehow folks deserving of sympathy and empathy and consideration and concern folks who have been failed by society, folks who we somehow owe something to. Because the only reason why anyone would ever turn to crime, the only reason why anyone would ever defy the lawful authority of somebody who we have entrusted to wear a badge and carry a gun um, is because we've somehow failed them as a society. That's the narrative. That's the mainstream refrain. And I've had about enough of it. And I think a lot of you have too. And listen, you know, this, my purpose here tonight is not to drive a wedge. It's not. I think it's time for us to come together. But in order for us to come together, we're going to have to universally condemn the people who have been driving a wedge in recent years, for a long time, folks who benefit from driving us apart. I sit on the Public Safety Committee of the Minnesota House of Representatives, and I've heard a lot of testimony regarding a lot of bills that have been presented, some of which I can guarantee you if, if Republicans were in the majority, we would not be hearing, and we certainly wouldn't be advancing. But in a certain sense, I'm grateful to be in the minority. In a certain sense, I'm grateful to have the opportunity to consider, be forced to consider the perspective of my political opponents. Because while I believe on the whole, they are taking us very much in the wrong direction. In some ways, they're ahead of the curve on particular aspects of public safety. Um, the fact of the matter is, if we are going to let people back out from the criminal justice system into the community, onto the streets, then we should be intentionally trying to guide them to a place where they can be peaceful, productive, and successful. That should absolutely be a goal. There's no doubt. Where I think the Democrats get it wrong, where I think my opponents get it wrong on the other side of the aisle, is that they assume that literally every criminal is redeemable. That every crime is the result of some systemic failure. 
um, that every criminal is somehow the victim of racism or discrimination. And this is simply not the case. The fact of the matter is that some people are just bad. Some people don't care about the rights of their neighbors. They don't have a moral conviction. They don't have a sense of right and wrong. And they're actually quite committed to the idea of taking what they want from people who are too weak to defend themselves. That is a real phenomenon. And such people need to be opposed. They need to be punished. They need to be segregated from polite society. They need to be insulated so that they don't have any impact upon the rest of us and upon our children and upon our communities. And I think what we saw this weekend is pretty indicative of that. A good man lost his life. A good man lost his life because someone who was bad retained their freedom retained their ability to act. I'm all for second chances. I'm all for redemption. I'm a Christian. I benefit from the grace of God. And I want to see that grace extended to as many people as who will accept it. But I also recognize that the vast majority of humanity throughout history has not accepted it. I recognize that repentance is not a common virtue. And while it is possible and while we should extend it to those who are willing to accept it, no innocent person, no Joshua Owen deserves to be victimized in order to give a criminal a second chance. I want to share with you um, some testimony and uh, an experience that I've had over recent weeks. Uh, again, I sit on the Public Safety Committee and uh, we have been presented with proposals um, in order to fund nonprofit organizations that are ostensibly doing good work in communities where crime is high. And it's a difficult thing for me to understand as somebody who has grown up in communities that don't require the types of services and interventions and restorative justice uh, that is being prescribed for the inner city that's being prescribed for Hennepin County, Ramsey County, the inner city, the Twin Cities. Um, out here in Wright County, out here in St. Michael, Abraville, we don't need nonprofit groups to keep us from killing each other. Strangely enough, we don't need services from the government to keep us from stealing, to keep us from encroaching upon the rights of our neighbors. We're just good people who don't hurt each other. And so it's difficult for us to understand out here why we ought to spend exorbitant amounts of state money in order to provide for organizations to provide services to other communities closer to the city, inside the city, to keep them from killing each other and hurting each other and stealing from each other. Shouldn't you just be able to do that? Shouldn't you just be a good person? Shouldn't that be a part of your soul? That's where we're coming from. At the same time, I think we need to recognize, no matter where we live in the state, no matter what our identity, no matter where we hail from, we need to recognize that there have been community failures. Um, the rate of single parenthood, the rate of fatherlessness, the extent to which folks have not been provided with the same types of opportunities that are common out here in Wright County is a real problem. Um, is it the responsibility of the state to fix that? Is it the responsibility of taxpayers that live out here in my district to compensate for the lack of morality, the lack of culture, the lack of virtue in Minneapolis and St. Paul? No, it's not our responsibility. It's not. But as an exhibition of grace, 
as an exhibition of philanthropy um, is their value. And if we have the opportunity to demonstrate virtue to our neighbors in other counties, and that results in systemic change, generational change, moral improvement, is that a worthwhile and defensible investment? I think so. But in order to in order to make it work, there has to be trust. And trust is a byproduct of relationship. And currently the relationships between folks out where I live and folks in the Twin Cities don't exist. And so in, in an effort to try to facilitate that, in an effort to try to bridge that gap and start a conversation, I'd like to introduce you to Pastor Jerry McAfee from New Salem Baptist Church in North Minneapolis. Now, Pastor McAfee came out to testify to the Public Safety Committee a couple of weeks back in favor of some state funding for grants to nonprofits that are doing work in North Minneapolis and other communities to try to intervene uh, in situations that are going south. And as you'll see in the interaction between myself and him and other testifiers and uh, Representative Cedric Frazier, I have a high degree of doubt or I expressed a high degree of doubt regarding the, the value of spending state money on such programs. Um, but I want to offer you, I want to give you a glimpse into reason for hope that this money might actually be well spent. As you consider what you're about to see, I don't want you to, I don't expect you to just accept it at face value. I don't accept it at face value. I remain skeptical. But I also have hope. I have hope that given the fact that there's nothing we can do to stop these investments right now, <laughs> that perhaps what we'll find in the interim between now and whenever the party balance shifts is that at least some of them are actually effective. At least some of them actually result in people developing a moral core, a moral center that keeps them from engaging in abhorrent behavior. That's my hope. That's my prayer. And I hope as you witness this, as you consider the testimony that you hear, that you'll come to the same spark of potential, the same spark of agreement and hope. You know, since the time that I've been here in the legislature, I've spent a lot of time talking to community members and having conversations around what they believe is needed for their communities to be safe. And, and, and in most cases, what I hear back oftentimes in those conversations is that, well, we need you all to invest in our communities. We don't feel and we don't see the investments over the last decades, over the last years. We feel like we've been left behind, like the resources haven't been concentrated to areas that need those concentrated, concentrated resources to ensure that we have safe communities. So what I've always, what I've asked them to do is, well, tell me what it is you need and tell me how much you think you need to get that done. So this appropriation is through those conversations, through these community groups coming together and having a conversation and putting together agenda and saying that here's the action that we think we need to take in our community and here are the resources that we believe that will be able to make us achieve those goals and make our community safe. The need to address violence is to understand that today's suspects could have been yesterday's victims. Victims whose home and community has impacted the choices they make in life. As we look at shooting victims, if we're looking at Minneapolis alone, age, and carjackers ages 12 to 16, which is 49%, is accountable for half the crime, for the crime um, in the community. 71% of the victims and suspects look like me, African American. But the issue is statewide. Therefore, our program starts with kids in elementary schools. We are dealing with a revolving door, not just adult suspects, but juvenile suspects as well. 
We have to be forward thinking and innovative with our work and our program. And I believe our successes as partners has netted results in reducing violence as acknowledged by MPD, Brooklyn Park Police Department, and St. Paul PD. The need for boots on the ground is even greater now, but the key is not just to interrupt cycles of violence, but preventing that violence before it even starts. That's the most important. In order to do that, you have to be out on the ground working with our youth, offering families community, and community members and the police the help that they need to move forward. The key is creating opportunities while giving services that have a real understanding of root causes and what it takes to change lives. It is not enough to just offer resources anymore. We have to be able to patrol, to teach empowerment classes, to tutor our young people, create jobs, train, for, train hire, uh, and mentor. Mentoring is the key as a means to reducing and preventing violence. Our work in partnerships within our communities and the police and with the police department in the different cities has shown that work on the ground with follow-up resources and programming is effective in reducing violence. What we really need is funding to do that on a larger scale. Um, so listen, the time has come. The time has come for a direct investment in the African American culture. Too many times that year after year pass, other people that do not live our lives, do not understand what we go through on a daily basis, tend to try to tell us what we need to do in order to survive. Y'all don't know what we need to do because you don't live the lives that we live. Only we know what it takes to make sure that we can survive and make it through these hard lives that we're going, going through. There's a lot that as we sit back and we watch daily on television, I think some of us could honestly say, man, that those people are living some rough lives and going through some hell of a things. And I think if we want to be finally honest with each other and finally stop bickering and fighting amongst parties and just say, you know what, in order to work together, we need to do the things that is going to help all of us survive and make these communities a lot better. And that's what we should focus on and that, that's what we should help with. A little bit ago I heard, uh, someone say about inventing a wheel, not, in, not reinventing the wheel. Well, I think we should reinvent the wheel because the wheel that was, in, re, that was invented didn't include us riding on it. That, that wheel that is out there has not worked in these communities, and I think we all know that when we sit back every single day and I watch our news across this country, we seeing that it's a group of people that are constantly losing their lives, losing their families, losing their communities, their homes, and everything else. The public is not safe, and there's only one way that we can say, you know what, let's try some new things, and I think a direct investment into these organizations, into this cause, into this bill, is, is one step closer to saying, I really do care. I really do want to see a change in the community because I care about those people, even if they don't look like me. I need not share with you nor tell you, because I'm sure you're cognizant of the fact of the level of violence and things that our communities and urban areas are permeated with. Since George Floyd from Minneapolis to St. Paul, we probably had over 300 homicides and over 1,500 people shot. It is our belief that a people that cannot save themselves is lost forever. You will never ever arrest away the problem. The affected communities must stand up within the confines of their community and say enough is enough and partner with other groups and organizations to bring peace in our community. One of the examples that I would give you a couple of years ago when LaDavion was shot in the head, when Anaya, eight and another six-year-old girl died, many of the churches, communities, and agencies got together and said, listen, we've got to do something. What's tragic during the George Floyd thing that has always been lost, we've always worked with the police in our community. Charlie Adams and the Adams family has been in Northside forever and a day, so we called Charlie, Charlie, what can we do? Charlie chose four areas that the police could not get to all the time. He chose the areas from the community, from a mother's love to uh, uh, 8 to 18, to all of the different churches. We occupied Lowry and Logan, 
36th and Penn, Broadway and Lindale, and another area. We occupied it for a minimum of 21 days because it is thought that whatever you can do for 21 days can be a force of habit. When I say occupy it, we would put people right in front of the door. While we're in front of that door, we're not just trying to block them, but we're also evaluating why are you out here in the first place? How come you ain't working? What do we need to do to get you a job? Do you need treatment? And so with that, we were able to create the necessary synergy within the confines of the community to get young men and women back to good. Some we were getting treatment, some we got in housing, and some needed to be arrested. If you don't want to change, we, got, we can't stop with the nonsense and say you just got to keep going. And we're happy to report on Broadway and uh, Lindale, we had an 18% turnaround. On 36th and uh, Lindale, we had a 68% turnaround. On Lowry and Logan, we had a 100% turnaround. And on 36th and Penn, we had a 100% turnaround. And those figures was kept by the Minneapolis Police Department. The way they were able to get those figures is one, you all know we got shot spotters, as well as they evaluated the 911 calls on how everything went down. It was a beautiful picture on the necessary synergy that is created within the context and confines of our community with stakeholders, churches, agencies, and police department working together for positive change. Since that time, we're located also in downtown St. Paul, downtown Minneapolis, and we can provide you data that shows that that works as well. I also need not insult you and tell you that we got a shortage of police. And if they got all of the money they need right now, they still won't be up to par because nobody's running to try to be police officers. We are ready, able, and willing to look that thing in its face and say we have to play a major role in our own survival. I wanted to speak to the comments, um, some of the comments I heard from Mr. Frost uh, that I think I appreciate the the obvious earnestness and sincerity and frustration um, in his voice that I, I'm sure is no doubt reflective of the sentiment in the community um, and just try to provide some feedback from what I imagine, what I imagine constituents in my district would respond with in, in response to that. So the idea of you need to let us fix our problems um, you don't understand what it's like to live the way that we live and to have the, the uh, cultural experience that we have. Um, and don't tell us what to do. Um, don't tell us how to fix it. Just let us fix it. All of that is completely relatable. Right up to the point where you end it by saying, give us $35 million to do with as we please without any strings attached or explanation of how it's going to work. Um, that's the tough sell. And as I've said in the committee before, um, I am eager to become a subject matter expert in how this stuff works so that if nothing else, I can go back to those folks in my district who don't understand why they don't need these things in order to not engage in crime. Um, how, it, how it's somehow a need somewhere else, but not a need where they live. Um, and that it's therefore, and, and, and if that being the case, how it's their responsibility to provide those resources um, for, for other people to figure out how to manage their communities without resorting to crime. Um, that's a really tough sell. And so my hope is, as I've expressed many times before, you know, once we get done with the session, I'm going to go back and I'm going to look through all these agendas and I'm going to be contacting all you guys because I want to get to know how it works um, so that if for nothing else, the, the value that is there, let's say there's a, a shift in the, the party balance at some point, we don't end up throwing out the baby with the bathwater. So thank you. Representative Frazier. Madam Chair, if I may, and, and Representative Hudson, uh, I appreciate that. And you often talk about your community, how your community does not understand these other communities. We do have community members here. Reverend McAfee, please come up and if you if you like to address Representative Hudson. Yeah, please go ahead. Thank you so much. We are certainly cognizant of the fact 
of the responsibility of tracking every dollar that's spent. I'm quite sure that most of us would agree uh, that a lot of money is spent and it don't necessarily go where it need to go to. We're in the process right now with DID, Downtown Improvement uh, District with uh, Minneapolis, of getting uh, sort of like a tracking app. So one, because I know if I'm going to hire you, I need to know where you at, <laughs> what you're doing, <laughs> the whole nine. And they're de designing an app that would be able to show and share uh, almost like the WhatsApp. I don't know if you're familiar with the WhatsApp, but on my phone right now, we got a team uh, downtown. Within every hour, I can tell you where my team is at because anybody who works hard, you don't want your money just thrown and can't see any uh, value from it. S stand up, Il, chill. 30 years ago, he was one of them boys on the block causing all kind of havoc and chaos. We were able to get our hands on him and show and share with him a better way. See, sometimes some of the ways we were raised, we take for granted that everybody was raised like that. They weren't. And so we were able to what we call in our community, breathe on him and get him the necessary tools that he needed to become the man that he is today. And so now he does what he saw us do with a lot of other young men. We and you all need to be able to see people. Do, don't put your money here and then that's it. No, 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 no. You ought to be having some other hearings on people that you can see that can testify and say that that's there. I'll say this and I'll hush. I'm sure you guys are cognizant of the uh, murder that happened at Harding High School not long ago. Have you noticed though, after that week, out of all those different shootings, the other two people killed, that for the last week or two, you haven't heard a whole lot? Can I share with you why? Stand up, Mickey Frost. Because what we did, we took every group that were stakeholders in those areas. I'm from Minneapolis. However, 21 Days of Peace is St. Paul as well. I call Pastor Patterson and Reverend Spence, who works with God Squad as well as the Sheriff's Department. We compare notes on everybody that's involved, everybody that's involved. And then we divide it up on who knew who you get to that family. Bob Fletcher came and he already had a, a list on them as well. What we're doing, is creating the necessary synergy to partner in alleviating and eradicating the pain and problems in our community. We then take those women and get them into the system of a mother's love. Because if you do all of this and we don't heal our families, it's going to be a cycle. So we want everybody to know we will be fiscally responsible. Now, after listening to Pastor Jerry McAfee, um, give his testimony on public safety. I was so compelled, as were some of my colleagues, that a couple of us decided that we were going to attend his church the following Sunday. And uh, we didn't make a big show of it. And I, I don't even know. I, I didn't even introduce myself to anybody. I was very stealth. I took my boys with me. And we sat and enjoyed a two-hour-plus church service in North Minneapolis at New Salem Baptist Church. And I want to share with you these excerpts from what Pastor Jerry McAfee had to say, because, um, listen, if this is the message that we are funding with our state dollars, I'm all for it. Take a listen. The messages of stewardship, which has been now for well over a month, was designed, one, to teach you God's methodology of one, sowing and reaping. Amen. And that you are supposed to be a wise steward over everything that he put in your possession. I talk and share with you, number one, you are to be a wise steward of your time. You are to be a wise steward over your talent. And you are to be a wise steward over your treasure. Because time and five minutes ago is something that you're not going to get back. I also shared with you the earlier messages that many times what God has given to you has been given to you based off of your intellectual ability. But it is incumbent upon you that if you want more, that you've got to groom your mind more so that you know how to handle the more that God 
Amos to give you. Remember, my people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge because they have rejected knowledge. Knowledge is the accumulation of information, which is your responsibility, but then it is God's job to give us wisdom, which is the explanation of the information. But many times, you never go beyond your information base because you're spending too much time doing stuff that's not productive. Amen. Come on and as a consequence, when you don't get and have as much as you think you have, sometimes you become a hater. Because you're looking in other people's yard and you're thinking that God is not treating you fair, but what you're not doing, you have not learned how to use what's in your hand. Let me try that again. You have yet learned how to use what's in your hand. See, that's not about what's in my hand, but if you take what's in your hand and put it in God's hand, God will plan it, and God will bring it back right. But too often, y'all, we will not groom our minds, we'll fill our minds with entertainment that is nothing more than containment. Oh, but how blessed it is that when you began to walk in the blessings of God by doing and using the principles of God and conforming your life to the will of God and then you began to see all of the things that God does, all the things y'all, and I, I didn't deal with this, God does work in seasons and sometimes you just, you just ain't been waiting on your season to come. But there are times, y'all, in the off seasons, you got to make sure that you're doing some special things in order to be one, anticipate what God getting ready to do. So, I mean, this message tonight, you know, a lot of the stuff that I do is geared towards people who generally agree with me. In this case, I'm throwing this out here to everyone um, with the expectation that it's going to upset everyone. Cause I'm just, I don't know if, it, I don't know if I'm, if it's that I'm dumb enough or that I'm humble enough or that I'm arrogant enough. I don't know what the quality is <laughs> that enables me to just say things without regard to how they're going to be taken. But whatever that quality is, um, it's fueling this video because I think we all, regardless of where we come from, we need to hear this. We need to see this. We need to take it into consideration. Um, the death of Joshua Owen is unacceptable. The extent to which we suffer in this state from unchecked, increased criminal activity is unacceptable. At the same time, the extent of fatherlessness is unacceptable. The extent of immorality is unacceptable. The lack of responsibility taken by individuals and communities is unacceptable and we can do better. And when I say we can do better, I don't, I, I'm not excluding everybody's included in the we. It's not just folks in my district or folks in Cedric Frazier's district or folks in the twin cities or outstate. It's all of us. We can all do a better job where we find ourselves. We can all bloom where we are planted to a greater degree than we currently are. Um, there's an opportunity in this state to have a better state. If we spend more time listening and less time arguing, not that arguments aren't worth having. There are plenty of arguments that are worth having and I'll continue to have them. But sometimes it can be braver. Sometimes it can be more novel and courageous to just listen. So let's do that. Have a good night.